Today I want to tell you about and kind of review a keyboard I found at a thrift store a while ago. This is a Gateway 2000 Any Key. The main claim to fame for these keyboards is that they are fully macro reprogrammable in hardware. Now, this is obviously an older keyboard. This one was made in 1993 and is PS2, but it's still a pretty interesting keyboard. Now, I've actually been using this as my main keyboard for the last month or so, so I thought it would be fun to tell you what I thought about the experience and just take a look at the keyboard overall. Aside from its hardware macro programming, the Gateway 2000 Any Key isn't particularly special. As I mentioned, mine was made in 1993, and this keyboard was actually produced by MaxiSwitch in Mexico. MaxiSwitch was a third-party keyboard manufacturer who, aside from making the Gateway 2000, would make many other keyboards and produce some generic ones like this that companies were able to rebrand on their own. They have their own switch type, which isn't really all that fantastic, but it gets the job done for the most part. Some people might like to know that the keycaps are in fact Cherry MX compatible by a coincidence. One thing I find particularly interesting about the Maxi Switch keyboards is that they all have their power rating printed on the bottom of the keyboard. It's a little unusual because it's not like there's a lot you can do about an AT or PS2 power requirement, but they all are kind of high. So we have 280 on this one, and I think the Gateway Any Key was around 360. I've measured the current consumption of a Model M is around 115 milliamps, so <laughs> these are both pretty power hungry. When the Any Key was originally introduced, it was an upscale option to Gateway's standard keyboard. This one is manufactured for Gateway by Keytronic. Both the Any Key and the standard keyboard are just rubber dome keys, but the Keytronic feels so much better than the Any Key does, so when you made the upgrade, you didn't get a better typing experience. But that wasn't as much of a concern then as it is now. I can't help but wonder how much input Gateway gave on the design of the Any Key. Here we have the Any Key, the other Maxi Switch keyboard I have, and the Gateway Keytronic keyboard. Now, the two Maxi Switch keyboards have a lot more in common than just the Switch type. Both of these have the large Enter key, the truncated Backspace key, which has the Pipe and Backslash key by it. Now, the Any Key does have some other layout things going on, but both of these are the same compared to the more traditional North American layout of the Keytronic keyboard. So I can't help but think that Gateway wasn't that interested in the fine details of this keyboard and just came up to MaxiSwitch and said, hey, make me an awesome macro keyboard, because it's very different from the layout of their traditional keyboards. All right, so let's take a look at this unusual keyboard layout. Now, as I mentioned, I have been using this on my main computer, which is easy since this keyboard's PS2. I can just plug it into a PS2 to USB adapter like this, and it works just fine. Now, the arrow keys, for the most part, work like you would expect. You have up, down, left, right, but you also have a middle key, which is actually the same as, oh, I guess it's enter? No, what is that key? I forget. Well, we'll find out in a moment. But the real thing to look at here is the diagonal keys, which do, in fact, move you diagonally. Now, there is no such thing as a diagonal key scan code. So what's going on here is it's actually pressing two keys in sequence. Let me bring up a key code scan monitor and we'll see about this. Now, if I press up, we'll see we get an up key. If I press left, we'll see we get a left key. If I press the diagonal key, we can see we get both an up and a left. So this is basically a predefined macro key for doing up and left. Now, this might have some drawback in games where you would be expected to hold down both keys at once. This may not be fully compatible with stuff like this. For example, in Vim, if I hold this down, you'll see that it's only going to go in one of the two directions. Now, Vim is obviously not a game. The games are going to be a bit different. This might actually work fine in games. I just don't have any installed on this computer because 12, 13 inch MacBook Pros came with a horrible graphics card, so it's just terrible. We'll get to trying games later on a different computer. Back to that center key though, uh, that's currently bound to down and that's actually my doing. So if I hold control and alt here, we can do the first key uh, macro related thing here. We can reset the macro keys. Now, while this is going, you can't actually do anything on the keyboard because it's clearing the memory. Here we go, now we're good. And that key is space, yes, that's what I thought. So if we go back to Vim here, we can see that it advances just like space does. It's actually really easy to macro remap keys. So let me show you how you do that. There are two main ways to do macro programming on this keyboard. 
actual macros and simple key remaps. Now, I find the space key in the center of this arrow cluster to be really inconvenient to use, especially on a modern computer. This layout is more akin to what you have going on on the numpad, except the diagonal keys replace the home and page up and page down keys that got shifted above it. To remap a key, it's very easy. All you have to do is press remap, press the key you want to copy to the new key, and then press the key you want to copy to. The program light goes solid for a moment, press remap, and then it's done. This key is now down, which is much more sensible when you're expecting the usual T shape that modern keyboards have. Now, aside from the diagonal keys on this, there are really only four more non-standard keys. That would be the pipe and backslash key, the asterisk key, and F11 and F12 up here. Now, this keyboard came out in 1993 and might have been originally produced in 1990. The jury's out on that. There's no definitive answer. But in general, this keyboard was pre-Windows 95, which means there wouldn't have been a Windows key between the Control and Alt keys. So, MaxiSwitch, I suspect, decided to just put some extra keys down here so you'd have more macro keys to play with. Now, these keys have independent uh, rows and columns to the other keys that they mimic. I'm not really sure which one that one does. Maybe it's numpad asterisk. But what that really means is you're free to rebind these however you want, and you don't have to worry about it affecting the other keys. This is pretty freeing. Now, I say that these two keys are the only other ones that are unusual, despite the fact that it has an extra set of function keys down here, because these are pretty similar to an XT keyboard that has its function keys along the side instead of along the top. So I consider these to be somewhat standard, just unusual for an AT era keyboard. Now, like the keys between Control and Alt, all of the extra function keys over here have independent key matrices to the other keys that are the same, so you can rebind these or these and not have them affect the other set. So that's again an additional 12 more macro keys that you could have if you would prefer to use these or the other way around. So this keyboard is just brimming with potential, let alone you have some keys that you don't need, like say you don't want insert or you don't really need uh, scroll lock. You could rebind a lot of stuff on here. So it's pretty cool to have one of these and to play around with that. All right, let's take advantage of some of those extra keys and take a look at the other form of macro programming that is true macros. Now, I kind of think the diagonal keys are useless. They at least have no real practical use on a modern computer. Maybe on older ones it could make sense if you had to do a lot of text editing in just pure text mode. Now, to program a real macro in here that is a sequence of key presses, it's kind of the opposite of remap. So you press the program macro key. Uh, on my model, you have to hold control first. The program key starts flashing, or program LED. Press the key you want to write the program to. So in this case, I'm going to go diagonal left, and then press the key sequence you want. So I'm going to do control, alt, left. That took me over one screen. Then I press program macro again, and it's done. Anytime I press this key now, it'll rotate through the virtual desktops on my computer. I can do the same thing again, the other side. There we go. Now I can easily switch between virtual desktops on Linux. Similarly to this, it might be useful to be able to switch tabs easily. So what I can do is hold control, program, press the, the key, and then in this case, I will want control shift tab to go back a tab, press program again to end it. I'll go ahead and program forward tab as well, which is control tab. And now I can easily switch tabs in a browser right with one key press next to the arrow keys. I feel like that's a pretty convenient thing and you can do that in all sorts of different applications as well. So those kind of shortcuts are just useful. Now, I got this keyboard in far from new condition. Matter of fact, the former owner used it so much that if I shine a light behind the letter keys, you can see a reflection off of some of them because they've been worn completely smooth. Even the bump on J to feel home row is just gone. You can only see a faint outline of dust compared to the F key. Now, I find this kind of funny that they use this keyboard so much because they didn't keep the manual that told you how to use it or anything. They wrote how to remap keys on the bottom, <laughs> which is just, wow, okay. They left out the real uh, macro command, though, that I just showed you, so that's kind of 
useless because that's the most complicated one. But still, that's kind of hilarious. I'm half tempted to get a blue Sharpie and write in the real macro key way because it just feels complete. This I've been using this keyboard on my lap, so I've accidentally worn this off a little bit. I'm going to stop doing that now, but for other reasons. So that'll stay true to the history of this keyboard. Now, I mentioned we'd try a game on this, and I feel like it would be appropriate to stick this on an older computer, but these XT-like extra function keys give me an idea of something I want to try. I'm going to try it out on my IBM XT. Now, normally this shouldn't be possible. It's easy to adapt PS2 keyboards to AT using an adapter like this, and it's even possible to use an AT keyboard on a PS2 port with an adapter like this. Usually, the only way you can use a PS2 or AT keyboard with an XT computer is if it has a dedicated switch on the bottom of it or somewhere hidden that allows you to switch the controller over from the AT protocol to the XT protocol. Now, the only reason I'm able to do this, and if you see the cursor here, I can move it around on screen even using the diagonal keys, is because a while back I was sent a PS2 to XT keyboard adapter by Monotech. Um, last I checked, they were sold out on the uh, webpage, but it does work with this, and I'm able to use it on this computer. So, we're going to take a look at using this keyboard on the 5160. Now, I was really hoping to be able to use my King's Quest 2 booter version uh, to try out this keyboard because I think an adventure game like this where you have to type in commands like look or search or something would be really cool to map those commands to the extra function keys, but I can't get this to boot. I mean, it just ignored the disk completely right there. So, yeah, it's not happy with this at all. Um, so, instead, I'm going to have to go with Planet X3 again because I really don't have any other games that have full motion uh, other than these two and well this one doesn't work so it's going to be Planet X3. Oh yeah also since you've last seen my 5160 I put an 8-bit EGA card in it configured it to CGA and have put the 5153 monitor on there so that's how it's able to do color. Oh uh, don't tell me my X3 disc is dead now too. Okay, terrible lighting and uh, camera work here, but the 5160's floppy drive has gone bad. King's Quest 2 does actually boot. I was able to boot it up on my 486, um, so that's what's going on there. I wasn't expecting to shoot that, and I didn't really want to rearrange all the lights. So, the 5160's floppy drive just failed. Awesome. Okay. Um, I guess I'll just connect the any key to the 486, and we'll use that. And for the record, I did try a cleaning disc in the 5160. It didn't help at all. As I'm putting it away, I'm feeling it, and I'm noticing the computer is extremely hot. So I'm wondering if the floppy drive has overheated somehow, and I should probably add a fan to this. I don't think the one in the power supply is actually working all that well. Matter of fact, that's what the buzzing is. So um, I guess I'll need to do a repair video on this at some point. Yes, this is definitely an XT PC. So it turns out King's Quest 2 was always going to be a bad example for this because when you press a direction, your person continues to walk in that direction and you can only change directions. But the diagonal keys press the keys too fast and the guy only walks in the first direction, which is always up or down. So the direction keys, or diagonal keys, just don't work. You can't press two keys at once in this game to have them go in a diagonal. But we can still do macros for stuff like look. So uh, let's do program macro F1, look, enter, and save. So now every time I press F1, it automatically does look. So if we move into a new area, let's see if we can find anything. There's nothing special. Okay. I've not really played King's Quest 2, so I don't know where I will need to go to find something special. This place looks pretty special. Oh, come on. Okay, look at mailbox. Maybe I'm going to want to... Uh... Alright, yeah, so let me get rid of that enter. Look, space, program. Alright. So now every time I press that, there we go, look at mailbox. Okay, so this is getting 
less useful. Uh, eh, let's try a different game that uh, I think this might work a little better for. This is the part where you don't see me spending two hours to set up a computer for the video, but I tried a bunch of stuff and I'm not really happy with any of the games that I found to demo the keyboard for playing games. It's really just not a gaming keyboard, it's a productivity keyboard, but SimCity 2000 worked for diagonal controls, but it's not that good because it's isometric. That um, You have the same problem with something like Diablo, so there's no real point in trying that out. Uh, I thought something like XCOM might be pretty good for doing squad commands over this, but I couldn't get this to install for some reason, so... Uh, pretty much my last resort was Retro City Rampage 486, and the only reason I went with that is because it's pure top-down, so diagonal keys actually kind of work. It's designed in such a way where you can just press the diagonal keys and you move in that direction. So, something game-related actually worked with this keyboard. Finally. Um, there's obviously better stuff you could use this for, um, and <laughs> there's no sound because Retro City Rampage is PC speaker only. It's making sound, it's just very quiet. Uh, putting the PC speaker up against the side of the case on the 46 wasn't the best idea for being able to hear it. I need to move it to the front where the uh, fan grill is. So anyway, yeah, keyboard, um, not that great for games. And you know what? I'll take this opportunity to talk about my experiences with the keyboard over the last month while I've been using it. So I mentioned that this is just a rubber dome keyboard and that it's nothing to write home about as far as the switch mechanics go. And it's very true. I don't find this to be a pleasant keyboard to use on a day-to-day -day basis because it's just not pleasant. I've been using Model M's for years now as my everyday keyboard, so it takes a pretty special keyboard for me to be able to like it. I've liked a couple of cherry keyboards. I have a cherry green keyboard especially that I like, uh, but this one doesn't cut the mustard for me. I also really hate the big enter key. It makes it a massive pain to type stuff, especially on like DOS here where now the uh, backslash key is in a different location. It's really annoying. So I don't like that. Um, I don't like the small backspace key. There's, It's just not pleasant to type on overall to feel. It's, uh, yeah. So I I don't plan to go back to this keyboard after I'm done recording this video. Matter of fact, I've already put a Model M back on the computer I was using this on. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun keyboard. It's cool in concept, but I just don't like it when I have to use it all the time, so I gotta say, you know, if you find one for cheap, it's worth it, but I wouldn't seek one of these out. Especially if you're gonna use it for something like this for old game computers, there's just not a lot of reason to use this. It's just not that good. So, yeah, uh, I think that pretty much covers this keyboard. There we go, got him. But, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed this look at the Gateway 2000 Any Key. Uh, if you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it. I'll see you next time.